Pisky, and I am filling in for Dan Barrow in this series that we've been studying on First and Second Thessalonians. Tonight we are in Second Thessalonians three, and I'm going to read chapter three, beginning of verse one. I'm going to read through the whole chapter, seventeen verses. You have a handout in front of you, which is twenty questions uh, that were written by Dan Marrow, and we are going to walk through those and see what the Lord's answers are from the Lord's Word. So follow along with me as I read God's holy word. Finally, brothers, pray for us that the word of the Lord may speed ahead and be honored as happened among you, and that we may be delivered from wicked and evil men, for not all have faith, but the Lord is faithful. He will establish you and guard you against the evil one. And we have confidence in the Lord about you, that you are doing the will of that you are doing and will do the things that we command. May the Lord direct your hearts to the love of God and to the steadfastness of Christ. Now we command you, brothers, in the name of God, for you yourselves know how you ought to imitate us, because we were not idle when we were with you, nor did we eat anyone's bread without paying for it. But with toil and labor, we work night and day, that we might not be a burden to you, any of you. It was not because we do not have the right, but to give you in ourselves an example to imitate. For even when we were with you, we would give you this command. If anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. For we hear that some among you walk in idleness, not busy at work, but busybodies. Now such persons we command and encourage in the Lord Jesus Christ to do their work quietly and to earn their own living. As for you, brothers, do not grow weary in doing good. If anyone does not obey, What we say in this letter, take note of that person and have nothing to do with him that he may be ashamed. Do not regard him as an enemy, but warn him as a brother. Now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times in every way. The Lord be with you all. I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. This is the sign of genuineness in every letter of mine. It is the way I write. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Okay, we are looking at page one. I've got the two-page handout that is in front of you. And we're looking at question number one. And um, it says in verses one and two, what does Paul request the Thessalonians to pray about. To be delivered from wicked men. Pardon? To be delivered from wicked men, it says here. Okay. Physical deliverance from wicked and evil men. That's one. There's one more thing, and that's correct. What's the other thing that Paul requests that they pray about? Something about the Word of God. Freely given or something? It says free course. Well, it says, Finally, brethren, pray for us that the Word of the Lord may speed ahead. So he's saying you need to pray that the Word of God would go out in full force, accomplishing God's will for God's purposes as God's intended. So that the word would be honored and that there would be physical deliverance from evil men. Question two says, what compliment does Paul give the Thessalonians? And that is in verse one. Those of you that are just tuning in on YouTube, we are in 2 Thessalonians chapter three. 
and we're looking at the entire chapter. So what compliment does Paul give the Thessalonians in verse 1? He's affirming that they're doing something. Well, that they're glor glorifying God. This word. They're glorifying God. Okay. <laughs> All right. He may be honored. Okay, that they... He's praying. He's he's affirming that they have honored the teachings, the word of God, that the word of God may speed ahead and be honored, and it was honored by these Thessalonians because they took the word of God seriously. Shouldn't we take it seriously? Yeah. So here, here's a question: How can we honor the word of God? What can we do to honor the word of God? Obey it. <laughs> obey it. Obey it. Very good. Yeah, if we obey it, we're honoring it, aren't we? If we tell our co-workers and our family members and our neighbors about the Word of God, we're honoring it, aren't we? If we read it with reverence and not read it with a with a like we're reading the newspaper, but we're reading it to discover God, aren't we honoring it? And they were honoring the word of God, and Paul recognized that. So in verse 3, uh, excuse me, in number 3, it says in verse 2, what force does Paul, over and over again, remind Christians to beware of? What force? And that is also in verse 2. Wicked and evil men. Wicked and evil men. And there's another description about them also, that's true. Unfaithful. They're unfaithful. So they're faithless, evil, and wicked. Faithless, evil, and wicked. Do you know any f faithless, evil, or wicked people? <laughs> I've got a few. <laughs> oh, I was down to Capitol today. <laughs> Oh, okay, okay, they're on the Capitol today. Ronald Peck said they're on the Capitol today. <laughs> they, they, have faith, they have faith, but faith in the wrong thing. Yeah. How many of you, right this second, right this minute, at 7.05, are um, up to date on what happened today? You've either seen the news or you you know what happened. Raise your hand if you did. I see pretty much. Someone. Most of you. I worked today, so I didn't see the news yet, so I only heard a couple of things. So uh, when I watch the news later, I guess I'll have a lot in store, right? It'll, oh, yes. <laughs> Not good news, right? Not good news. Not it, was, good news. it was on all day. Typ you can... Typical slant on it. Too, so. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure. <laughs> Wicked, evil, and faithless men. And, and question number four says, what is the very important promise in verse 3? I'm going to read verse 3 again. But the Lord is faithful. He will establish you and guard you against the evil one. What's the promise? He'll protect us. The Lord is faithful. Well, that's a statement, we'll not a promise. We'll keep you from evil. And protect us. Yeah. So what is it, Keith? What's one of them, Keith? He'll protect us from the evil one. Okay, he's going to... Uh, guard believers or protect believers. Uh, and what's the other promise? There's two parts to it. Strengthen. So he'll establish. Strengthen. Establish or strengthen. In other words, he's going to fortify us. He's going to hold us uh, because he is our anchor. He is the anchor of our soul. And we are not going to float off like driftwood in the open sea. And just be out there in um, outer space, just floating along like space debris. We are anchored in and we are established in and guarded by the Lord. He is our shield. He is our buckler. He is our refuge, isn't he? Okay, wonderful. Very good. You're doing very well. So how about number five? What's Paul confident about? In verse 4. That, that the people are going to do what God wants them to do. 
Okay, I believe Paul we'll believe that. That he'll do both do and will do the things. That they're already doing the right things and they're going to continue to do the right okay, things. Okay, I believe that's true. But there's something else in there in verse 4 that's real um, black and white. One more thing I'm thinking of I see there. Are you talking about the Lord touching them? No, <laughs> it says, and we have confidence in the Lord. Yeah, what well, mine says, in the Lord touching you. <laughs> <laughs> Is that KJV? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Okay, I, I didn't bring uh, multi-translations tonight. I only have one translation. And uh, how about if you read, Pat, you read verse 4, the whole verse. Okay. And we have confidence in the Lord touching you that ye both do and will do the things which he commanded you. Okay, we have confidence in the Lord. And then I just stopped there. The point I want to get is the confidence is not in ourselves. Right, right. And that's one of the problems with some some believers and some churches. We, we talk about self-confidence, and self-confidence is important. But when we're talking about Christian work, when we're talking about missionary work, and that's what this is, missionary work, we need to be confident not in ourselves, not in our churches, but confident in the Lord, because it's the Lord who's going to do it, isn't it? Yeah. Paul's going to speak the word, Peter's going to speak the word, Timothy's going to speak the word, the Bible writer's going to speak the word, but they're not going to convict anybody, are they? No. Who's going to do that? The Lord. The, Lord. the Holy Spirit, the Lord, keep that, that's right, the Holy Spirit. And they're not going to save anybody, right? Who's going to save them? God. The Lord. The Lord. <laughs> and they're not going to regenerate anybody. Who's going to regenerate them? The Lord. The Lord, the Lord. The Lord. okay. Yeah. So our confidence needs to be in the Lord. Lord. Thank you. <laughs> you might say, boy, he's really pounding this. I am. I am. Because I do counseling every day, all day. I've been in therapy all day today with patients from 9 o'clock this morning till um, 5 o'clock. And um, so many people are, are confident um, in themselves and in other things. And I, fortunately, I have some people that I talk to in, in psychotherapy who are believers, and those are people whom I encourage to put their confidence in Christ, not their confidence in Craig or their confidence in anybody else. Don't believe it because I said it. And don't have faith because I have faith. Have faith because God is faithful, and our confidence needs to be in Him. Isn't that right? Yeah. Okay, wonderful. Confident in the Lord. And number six says, into what two things did Paul pray God would direct their hearts? What two things did Paul pray that God would direct their hearts? And that's from verse five. God's love. Christ's perseverance. I'm sorry? God's love and Christ's perseverance. God's love and Christ's? Perseverance. Okay, good. Very good. We pray in that um, they would, that God would direct their hearts in God's love and in the steadfastness of Christ or in the stability in Christ or the security in Christ. I mean, we need to be well grounded in the Lord. We have a lot of uh, enemies. I mean, the Lord's enemies are the believer's enemies, aren't they? I mean, once we name Christ, all those who are against Christ are against us too. And um, we need to be so well-grounded. Everybody needs to know not only what you believe, but what else? Not only what you believe, but what else? Why. Why you believe it. Okay? So if a person says, well, I'm, I'm, I'm a Christian and I'm, I'm born again. Somebody might say, yeah, well, tell me why you're born again. Why did you do that? Well, because God led me. Well, it, it, they'll, they'll take it apart. Yeah. Yeah. And we've got to be solid, sound, convinced, and convicted in our own selves. And if anyone isn't really sure of why they believe what they believe, they need to get a study Bible. And I'm going to read some study notes from this. This is called the English Standard Version Study Bible. And this is the translation we have upstairs in our pews. 
And it's an excellent study Bible that has studied notes that helps to explain some of the reasons why we do what we do, and it gives different opinions. And you'll see the beauty of this later on, because I'm going to read a few uh, footnotes later on. Okay, number seven, read 1 Thessalonians 5.14. So we're going to turn over there. And if I could have a volunteer to read that, and if you would just call it out real nice and loud so the people on the, the YouTube would be able to hear it, that'd be nice. And we urge you, brothers, warn those who are idle, encourage the timid, help the weak, be patient with everyone. Okay, good, good. All right, so there's four Christian responsibilities in that text. Take a look at that again. There's four things. Sometimes Christians say to me, I don't know what the will of God is for my life. And they email me, they PM me on Facebook. I get this question all the time. Can you tell me what God's will is for my life? I'll bet you if I had a dollar for every time somebody asked me that, I'd be a millionaire. And I'm like, well, what does the word say? Well, here's the will of God for your life, friends. There's four things that is the will of God for your life. And it's 1 Thessalonians 5.14. So don't give me all four. I want four different people. What's one of them? First, we're in 1 Thessalonians 5.14. Okay. And we urge you, brothers, what? What's the first one? Mine says warn the unruly, but it says it can also mean lazy. Yeah, Yours says warn the unruly, and what else? Well, I, my notes say it also can mean lazy. Those that are lazy. Yeah. Can mean lazy, huh? Well, I think they're lazy in their faith. Warn those who are idle. Yeah, yeah idle, idle. Well, we're Well, not, we're not there yet. It doesn't say that in verse 14. It yeah. says warn. Yeah, mine does. Mine does. Yeah. yeah. That's the first one. That's the first one. Yeah. Okay, I stand corrected. Part of the problem is I'm using the ESV and it's a little different. Warn the unruly. Let's go with that one. Warn the unruly. In ESV, it says admonish, admonish the idle. Okay. Um, what does warn the unruly mean? That's your Christian responsibility. That's my Christian responsibility. What does that mean? What? I, I think if you see somebody that, you know, you're questioning what they're doing is, is right. You need to go to them and talk to them. And what do we need to tell them? We need, well, we need to show them in the Bible. We need to show them in the Bible. And what do we need to show them in the Bible? Where God tells them what they should be doing. <laughs> what God wants them to do. Yeah, not what they're doing. Okay, they need to know what God wants them to do. Not your opinion, not my opinion, not our opinion. To be honest with you, your opinion and my opinion in one dollar will get you a sweet tea at McDonald's. Yeah. Some days. <laughs> <laughs> that is if they're open. Yeah. If they're open or you can get their right McDonald's. So, so it's not a matter of opinion, and it's not a matter of what you think, and it's not a matter of what I think. It's a matter of what God said, right? So Pat's exactly right. We That's need to show people what the Word of God says. So when we tell them something, they have the why for it. Yeah, you, you can't go to them and say, I think what you're doing is wrong. That's you, right. Because you need to say, according to the Word of God, what you're doing is wrong. And here's where, here's where I'm coming from. Because what I think doesn't mean anything. And you know what? Sometimes when I'm talking to people about things like this, I don't even use the word wrong. I do it a little different, but the same idea. I'll say to a person, uh, I see your X, Y, Z. I'll say, yeah, you know, X, Y, Z. And I'll say, well, you know, God has a little different idea about X, Y, Z. And they'll say, yeah, well, what is it? I say, well, let me show you what God says about X, Y, Z. And I'm using X, Y, Z for whatever it is, whether it's smoking or drinking or premarital sex or whatever it is. So I'll say, well, let me show you what God's Word says. I'll show them the verse. And, and sometimes they'll look at it and say, I guess I shouldn't be doing that, should I? And I'll say, <laughs> well, what do you think God would say to that? <laughs> if Jesus was here right now, what would Jesus say? Oh, Jesus would say I shouldn't do it. Well, there you go. I never said anything, did I? No. <laughs> because what I say is irrelevant. 
It doesn't matter what Craig says. And quite frankly, it doesn't matter what any of us say. None of us. It only matters what God says. Right? I mean, we worship him. We adore him. It's his word that we're reverencing. Not my sermon or our opinions or our preferences, but the word of God. Is that right? Okay, good. So we got four things in 1 Thessalonians 14. We did one. And um, we're going back to that. Warn the unruly or admonish the idle. What's the second one? Encourage the timid. Encourage the timid. Encourage the timid. Encourage the faint-hearted. In other words, we are called to be encouragers. And sometimes we can get so negative, you know, well, you shouldn't do this. You know, thou shalt not. I'm like, well, wait a minute. How about showing them something encouraging first? In my opinion, it's better to make the connection before you make the correction. And if you make a connection with somebody and they trust you and they're willing to listen to you, then you can share things and they'll be more likely to, yeah. to receive them. <clears throat> I don't think we're going to win anybody to the word of God or to salvation or to biblical thinking by smacking them on the head with a Bible verse. We don't want to smack anybody except maybe Buddy, but only occasionally. Aww. And if you're on YouTube, Buddy's a dog. Okay, how about the third one? Help the weak. Help the weak. Now, what does that mean, Jim? That's excellent. That's exactly right. Give me an example. I want a couple of examples. Oh, yeah. Show them in the verse where if they're like weak in their faith, where they could improve upon their faith. Okay, where they can improve upon their faith. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. I think it's also talking about when you, when somebody's a new Christian. Yes. You know, somebody's just, a new just Christian. Just like when babies are born, they're weak. You know, a baby can't take care of themselves, so you have to sometimes help people along and not expect them to be on your level just because they've accepted Christ. That's right. That's exactly you know, sometimes right. Sometimes we think that they should, you know, well, get with it, you know? They have to walk along, and I think that's what I consider a weak person. That's somebody that just really needs the knowledge of what they need to do and, and what the Word of God says. Excellent. What about could some other illustrations? I want more illustrations. Could, Go ahead, could you stretch that in uh, maybe somebody with low self-esteem as far as being weak? If a person has low self-esteem yeah. to help them with that? Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Actually, that's part of my job because a lot right. of people... I thought you'd relate to that. That's what I'm asking you. Yeah, no, that. absolutely. You know, in, in, in what I'm doing, I'm doing... I'm a licensed mental health counselor. That's my title... My license is licensed professional counselor by the state, and I'm basically doing basic psychotherapy. And what that boils down to is to offer encouragement, emotional support, guidance, and to help people understand the options before them. Now, that's not all it is, but those four, uh, four markers in it. And um, sometimes what that means is, you know, a person will say to me, hypothetically, well, I work for Target, and I'm having trouble with my supervisor and my coworkers. so when I go to work tomorrow, I'm just going to quit and walk out. Well, what I'm going to say to them, I'm going to give you an example, I'm going to say to them, I don't think that's in your best interest. And they'll say, why not? And I say, well, your job record's going to follow you. If you get another job and they ask for a reference from your former job, they're going to say that you just walked out. Mm -hmm. And so the person might say to me who works for Target, okay, well, what do you think I should do? And I turn it right back to them and I say, why don't you tell me what you think you should do? And then they'll say something like, well, maybe I should give them more notice. And then I'll say... <laughs> Instead of going out, right? right? And then I'll say something like, "Well, how much notice do you think I should give them?" Well, I don't know, and, and then we'll talk about that a little bit, and then they'll say, "Okay, I'm going to give them two weeks' notice tomorrow." Mm -hmm. And then I'll say to them, "How are you going to do that?" Well, 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 
They don't have a clue. <laughs> they haven't thought that far ahead yet. And what are they going to do to French come? Yeah. Yeah. What's that? What do they do yeah. Well, I'm getting to that. I have got that for you. <laughs> I don't want to spend an hour on this one illustration, but, but you're right. Okay, so I'll say, well, maybe it would be easier if you put it into writing. And then they kind of screw their face up at me. And, mm -hmm. <laughs> oh. Write it? Uh, uh, on paper? Oh, yeah, paper. <laughs> on parchment. <laughs> don't, don't write it on the wall, because then it's graffiti, right? I quit! No, so, so I, I'm trying to help them make choices, make decisions, and make things that are in their best interest. And um, I never tell anybody what they should do, not even believers. But what I do with believers, I have, I've had believers say to me, I don't get, this, this, this happened, I don't get Matthew 5, 14 through 17, something about eating, eating people. <laughs> Enough about eating people in Matthew 5, 14. <laughs> so, so sometimes I'll open the scripture. I've got to be careful about that because I can't turn a counseling session into a, into a Bible well, study. But I can't answer a question. And, uh, and I have to do it quickly with them. So, um, you know, I'll, I will point to them. I'll recommend a book. I have people that tell me, uh, I don't have any credit and I don't know how to handle money. What do you think? I said, I think you should go to the library or Amazon and buy Managing Your Money by Larry Burkett. How many of you know the name Larry Burkett? Most of you, okay. He's got about a dozen books. And on my computer, because I'm on a laptop, that, not like that, but a bigger one, big laptop, while I'm talking to him, I'll pull up the internet, and I'll go to Amazon, and I'll say, Larry Burkett's $5.99 used, $14.99 new. And I did that. I've actually done that with clients. And uh, so I'm not telling them what to do, but I'm giving them resources, and I'm holding them accountable. Because I give interventions every week. I need to shut up about counseling and get back to the text, don't I? First Thessalonians 5.14, what's number three? Be patient. Patient Be towards patient. all That's men. I think we all need that in the United States, the whole world. <laughs> Be well, patient towards all men. Be, pa Be patient. patient with them all. Yeah. Or Everybody. Yeah. How many of you need more do patience? <laughs> don't pray no. for it. How many of you have enough patience? I don't see any hands. No. <laughs> So, so here Some we go, four lot. things, admonish the idlers, yeah. encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, and be patient for all men. I mean, that's a lot to do, isn't it? So you want to know what the will of God is for your life? There it is. I didn't say it. I didn't write it. God did. All right, what is the topic for the remainder of 2 Thessalonians 3, 6 to 15? Can I have a copy of that? Sandy, please. Oh, you don't know the answer. <laughs> I, I put the answer on here. Oh, I thought I thought Dan did it. <laughs> no, I actually I wrote this. Histon, if you remember, you have never seen any of his handouts with lines on it because he doesn't do that. Okay. See the lines? Yeah. Okay, why well, what I did is I used all his questions exactly as he did it. I added some lines. And I gave you a free answer. See, free answer? And the reason I did that is because that's such a long passage. We could spend the rest of tonight in that one passage. And I didn't want to get caught up in one, one hook. So what I did is um, I used my ESV study Bible, and I gave you the outline for that passage, the command of the community. And who's the community? The command to the community is in verse 6. Who is the community? You don't need to look. You should just know. Church. What is it? Tim? Church. The church. The church is the community. It's the community of faith. The tradition, and the tradition is Paul's uh, teaching. The problem is these idlers. The command to the idlers. And then the instructions to the community. So I gave you that as a freebie. Um, let's go back, uh, 2 Thessalonians 3, verse 12 is the command of the idlers, and we're going to talk about who the idlers are in a little later. Now, 
Such persons we command and encourage in the Lord Jesus Christ to do their own work quietly and to earn their own living. And there you have it. So that's the topic for the remainder of 2 Thessalonians 3, 6 to 15. I don't really want to do any more with that than that, unless somebody has a question about that. Okay, no questions. So, the next one. In verse 6, whom does Paul command the Thessalonians to keep away from? Verse 6. Every brother who's idle and doesn't live according to the teaching. Yeah, speak a little louder because they can't hear you over here. Every brother who's idle and speak and speaks doesn't speak according to the teaching. Okay, it's talking about the idlers, isn't it? Yeah. It's talking about the idlers. Now, verse uh, number 10 says. Who might be a brother that Paul refers to in verse 6? Who might be a brother whom Paul refers to in verse 6? This is Dan's question. Dan is suggesting that there's a particular person referred to in verse 6. Well, I have a, a study Bible. My study Bible said that some people believed that Christ was going to come back any time, so they... Quit their work and do can, can you hold on to that? That's my next question. That's not this question. <laughs> well, you're, you're, you're identifying who the idlers are. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, that's that's, that's okay. a little later. And you're actually, you're absolutely right. But hold that. That's not that's not okay, the question. Okay, I'll sit my lip. <laughs> who might be a brother that Paul refers to? It, it, Dan is suggesting there's an individual that, that Paul's referring to. I didn't write this question. And to tell you the truth, that's the only one I don't have an answer for. Because <laughs> I'm not sure. So help me out. Let me give you the answers. Pardon? Let me give you the answers. No. <laughs> he gave me two pages of questions. He said, here's the questions. So I had to write my own answers. Maybe it would have to be each of us individually who would deter us maybe from not following what God wants us to do. And that would be our... I don't know, person that we're following that we shouldn't. <laughs> hmm. I don't know. Okay. Any other idea for um, number 10? Well, you know, I have the King James. The King James says every brother that walketh disorderly. So I yes. think it's talk, not talking about yeah. a single person. It's talking about <coughs> more than one person in the church that might be. That's okay. what I was thinking. They also call them busybodies in my Bible, too. Yeah, it's called busybodies in mine, too, but that's yeah. my next question. Okay. Well, <laughs> well let's go on to the next question, then. <laughs> yeah. We're still on page one, number ten. You know that's what, what I was thinking, thinking about, about an individual. If, you know, one person might think, oh, let me listen to everything. Yeah. And some people won't bother at all to listen to the busybodies or whatever. <laughs> you know. Okay. You know. So it could be, who might be a brother that Paul refers to in verse 6? It could be that brother is any believer who is an idler right. and or, a busy yeah, well, yeah, yeah, could be. Okay. All right. All right, now we come to question 11. What is meant by the one who is idle and does not live according to the teaching received from Paul, Timothy, and Pilus? Titus? Silas? I'm going to read my footnote on 3.6 from the, from the ESV Study Bible. Paul strongly commands the community as a whole to discipline by disassociation those who are not working but are depending on others for a living. The community is to keep away from these idlers, which probably means excommunicating them. Paul takes the sin of these people seriously, but at this point, he still regards them as brothers. And that in idleness, I have the Greek word here, it means in an undisciplined, hence unruly in the King James, in an undisciplined, irresponsible, and disorderly manner. These people are shirking 
their obligation to work. And we know we're supposed to work from Genesis 2.15, don't we? Didn't God command Adam yes. and Eve to work in the yeah. garden yeah. and to tend to the garden? God created us to work. Their behavior was not in accord with the tradition, that is the biblical teaching, passed on by the missionaries regarding the necessity of working for one's team. Craig, yes. Dan answered the previous question here, if you would like me to read what he put. Oh. Question number 10. Okay. <laughs> and, and you were right in a way. Every brother or sister who refuses to follow attempted correction and remains idle, etc., so exactly. it is. Yeah, and that's what That's I said. what he had in mind. So every but they, is that's from Dan. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dan. <laughs> Thank you, Dan. <laughs> say that for every brother who, right. who refuses to follow oh, attempted okay. corruption and remains like. So, so are we all clear on who the idlers are? Let me tell you what the, what I learned in seminary, and. Um, about the historical period uh, and this particular church, which is in Greece, in Thessalonica, what had happened is a lot of people were, and Dan had touched on this previously in Second Thessalonians, that a lot of people had assumed um, that they knew that the Lord was coming back in their lifetime. So if you knew, all of you that are working, or, or even if you're not working, that Jesus is going to come back uh, January 10th, 2021. I'm not saying he is. This is hypothetical. Would you continue to go to work each day? Or would you quit your job and start cleaning your house and getting things in order because you know you're going home in four days or five days. I'm going to clean my house. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No. Clean your house. No. Why? Would, why? <laughs> okay. Craig, we'd have to find people to take care of our animals. There you go. Clean your house means take care of your animals. Thank you. Find Pastor somebody to Sandy. take care of them when we're That's gone. That's exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. He's going to watch the Super Bowl before he goes to heaven. Well, historically, what would happen is a lot of people had assumed that they weren't going to die. They, they, just, they just had it in their head. It's going to happen, and it's going to happen in my lifetime. So why do I need to work? Why do I need to struggle? Why do I need to do all this stuff? I'm going to quit my job. And we're all going to sit around and drink coffee and just wait for the Lord to come. Well, that's what they were doing in Greece. And that's why you have so much eschatology here in First and Second Thess Thess uh, Thessalonians, because they had it all balled up. They had it all jumbled up. And Paul's trying to make it super clear. You folks don't know the day of the Lord. You don't know the timing of his coming. And you need to get up, get out, get busy, do your job, do your job quietly, and work for your own money to buy your own food and do it now. That's what he said, didn't he? Like we're doing it. That's the message. And um, so Paul doesn't want the 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 community, the the church of God in in Thessalonica, to uh, get lost in this this. This, um, this group of people that um, really are promoting false doctrine, false living. I have a question. Do you want to hear it from Yeah. Here? <laughs> Vivian asks, can we take our animals with us <laughs> when the, oh, when the yeah. Lord comes? <laughs> Just grab Lukey on the way up. <laughs> Come on, Lukey! <laughs> hey, if I call it's Lukey, he always goes huh? to Pam, so hopefully <laughs> Pam's ready to grab him. <laughs> That's a good good question. I, I'm not sure we have an answer for that, Vivian. <laughs> well, I'll tell you an answer somebody gave me. I asked that of somebody once a long, long time ago. And I'm not saying it is or it isn't so. I don't know. I don't know. But somebody told me, if God thought you would be happier in heaven with your animal than without your animal, they'll be there. Now think about that one. Mm -hmm. That's what he said. I've thought about that for years. Mm. Mm. Well, wouldn't you be happier, though? 
all the time. There's no sadness in heaven. And sometimes my cat makes me very sad. <laughs> when she's up on top of the tree eating the top of the tree. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. How can a little feline make a, an accomplished Christian like you sad? Because Explain she, that one to because me. Because she climbs up on top of the tree and she's eating the top of my Christmas tree. Well, she wants a better view. <laughs> Come on now. She's a good star. That's right. Yeah. She's, she's a living star. I'm just saying, you know. I wish I had a cat on top of my Christmas tree. Aww. I'll give you a cookie on any day. <laughs> no, no, you can't do it. It's already put the tree away. <laughs> you have to wait till next She'll year. She'll find out something else to get. I'm just saying. I don't know if we'd be actually happier with our animals there. <laughs> So I don't know. I just don't know. I, don't I forgot we have questions coming in. I you forgot there's that. other people listening to you, didn't you? Are there any, oh, I knew there were some listening, but I didn't know there were questions coming in. Are there any other questions? Not that. Okay, so let's go now to question number 13. Why did... No, 12. Who were the Thessalonians to follow or imitate? Yeah. Now be careful how you answer this. Think about no, this won't. answer. No, we won't answer in that case. <laughs> <laughs> There's a short answer and a long answer. Who were the Thessalonians to follow or imitate? I'm looking for that verse. Yeah, well, in verse 7 it says, follow us. And of course, Paul in another place said, follow me as I follow Christ. Okay. Well, let's the just, go with, let's just go with this text. Christ. Let's just stay with this text. You said, follow us. Now think about this. Who is the us that he's talking about? And think about who the us were. Now I know you're going to say, oh, he's talking about Paul. Well, yeah, I know that. But Paul and others, and who were they to the Greeks? What was their job? What was their title? Who were they to the Greeks? To this church? The, you mean the believers? Uh huh. Were they villains or something? <laughs> you know, I mean, right. Like villains or something? They were thinking no, no, no. we we're should. talking about Paul and Silas. Yeah, you know, I know. We're... I know, but I mean, to the Greeks, do they. <laughs> the ones that weren't believers. Or, you know. Are you thinking Jewish Christians? That's what I mean. That... <laughs> Missionaries? Come on. That's what I'm looking for. <laughs> They're missionaries. Oh. So I know what people say. Okay, well, it's Paul, and Paul was a, a, a apostle. Paul was a church leader. Well, in, in this case, Paul was a missionary. He made three missionary journeys. Three times he went out and preached the word of God. Telling how God wants them to live, uh -huh. like the missionaries are doing now. So the answer that I have on my thing. page is what, what you said. Who said that? Pat or did you say Pat. that? Pat. Joe. Pat. 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 The missionaries. Because Paul is <laughs> acting as a missionary yeah. as he's going out on his missionary yeah, journeys. Yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay, does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, good. Very good. And number 13, why did Paul work to support himself? And that's in verse 9. Say it louder. He would not be a burden. To, yeah, make himself a model to follow. Make to himself a... a model to follow. I like that. I wrote it to set an example worthy of imitation. To make an example to follow. That's perfect. That's exactly what I thought. How about 14? What was the role, rule? What was the rule, Paul, Silas, and Timothy, and their category as they're on their first, second, and third missionary journey is Paul is a what? It's not on the paper. I just said it. Pat said it. A missionary. A missionary. Okay. So what was the rule that the missionaries established? You Verse 10. Don't, you don't if you don't work, you don't eat. Exactly. <clears throat> no work, no eat. No work, no eat. Okay, so now we come to number 15. And 15 is a little bit more to it, uh, and I'm going to read my footnote. Is there a connection? Is there a connection between the fact 
is some of the Thessalonians were idle and their faulty ideas about the second coming. So let me read this footnote because there's two views and you can take your pick and um, and I'm reading a footnote on 3, 6 to 15. Just give me one minute to find that. Okay, here it is. I'm reading out of the English Standard Version Study Bible footnote. The problem of the idlers. Paul instructs the Thessalonian community to exercise church discipline on those refusing to work. Although there is nothing in 1st and 2nd Thessalonians that explicitly links the idleness with the confusion about the end times, many think the Thessalonians stopped working to await and proclaim the Lord's coming. That's what I just said a couple of minutes ago. That was what I said my view was. Others believe, now here's the other view, others believe that the problem was re really one of lazy Christians exploiting the charity of wealthier Christians and using their free time to meddle in others' affairs. Whatever the case of the idleness, Paul's patience was evidently run out with these people. So those are the two views, and um, you can take your pick on them. I, I favor the first because there's a, a historical corollary. If you study the history of this church in Greece, that was what was going on. So it's not made up, or it's not speculation, it's not opinion, it's historical fact. So there is a, th a theme of historical fact there. But others see it differently, and, um, and, and quite frankly, um, I don't think it's a, a major issue which way you go with that. The, prof, the bottom line is there were idlers and they needed to be dealt with and Paul is encouraging the, the, the Thessalonians to, um, to deal with them as he had said. Any other thoughts, questions, or discussion from that? That's number 15. Any questions online? Oh, I'm safe. Okay, number 16. Are we all ready? Here we go. Whose bread were the idlers to eat? Whose bread were the idlers to eat? The bread that they earned. They earned. The bread they earned. That's exactly right. Their own bread, the bread they earned. And in verse 13, it says, never tire of doing what? In verse 13, never tire of doing what? Well doing. Well doing. Well doing, 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 good. doing good. That's good. exactly right. right. Okay, good. And number 17, uh, number 18 says, what is the value of disassociating with the idlers? What is the value of disassociating with the idlers? You know what disassociating yeah, means, right? Well, because sometimes you hang with those kind of people and drag you down. Yeah. They drag you down. The book of Proverbs says you become like the company you keep. Right. So you're absolutely yeah. right. Okay, they can drag you down. Uh, they can set an example for you that you follow, and it's a bad example. Okay, any more on that on question 18? Wow. If everybody disassociates with the guys that aren't working, and then they have nothing to eat if they don't work. <laughs> exactly, and that would be a real good internal motivation to work. Right, right. you're yeah. motivating them to yeah. do what's right. So, yeah. so, so, following eat. Pastor Joe's comment, if one of those people who was being disassociated uh, was all by himself. And his stomach began to roar and growl, okay? And uh, he started working right next to one of the brothers that had admonished him to work. And the brother said to him, what changed your mind? What do you think he might say? I'm hungry. <laughs> I'm hungry. My stomach's growling. <laughs> I mean, that's a good internal motivation, isn't it? 
You don't work, you don't eat. And if you get hungry enough, you'll work, won't you? Good, good. All right, I'm going to read another footnote here on 314. PSV Study Bible footnote. I was just going to say, Pat Watson said on here, it's, it's like tough love. You know, if... It's like tough love. Somebody other than the Pastor Sandy tell me what tough love is. She said it. I mean, she... she Pat, Pat, Pat Watson. Pat okay. Watson. Tell me what tough love is. When you hear that, what do you... What do you... What does that refer to? Wait. Sandy? Did you say something? No, I didn't. I saw your eyes <laughs> coming around the back of his head. Did you? <laughs> well, it would be uh, doing something that's very difficult to do, even though you feel compassion. If you feel bad for him, it's, you know, just... Standing your ground and not giving in to it. Okay. You want to teach them what's right. Standing your ground, not giving in, and mm -hmm. holding someone accountable. Right, there you go. Okay, yeah, accountable for their choices. <laughs> accountable for their decisions. Yes. Accountable for their actions. <laughs> and also accountable for their inactions. So, yeah. That's what don't work, don't eat means. Right? We, we need to do that more with our kids today. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They get in a tough bind and right away... You want to bail them out. I know. You you look at me and you should. Be careful. Your daughter-in-law's on here. <laughs> Who said that? Who said that? Was that Fred? Jim? I'm, just, I'm just saying that, you know, I, I think we're all guilty of it. You know, yeah, we are. You, we are. Kids, your kids pass. make bad choices and you want to help it's them out. You, you want to fix it. You want to fix it. You want to fix it, but sometimes you have to step back and just let them fall in the mud. And get muddy. Either that or just warn them about the mud and show them that they can walk around the mud easily. Well, no, but yeah. sometimes they have to fall to learn. Yeah, sometimes yeah. that's true. If it's a clown, you can tell them to walk around. But they you might tell them to walk around, but they'll say, oh, you're so old, funny, daddy. You don't know nothing about no mud. I can, <laughs> hey, I can, I can, I can handle old, funny, daddy. I'm a big boy. I can handle that. I'm just saying, I'm talking especially when you're dealing with your, your offspring. I know. Or your grandchildren or whatever. You're, I don't have any grandchildren, but, you know, sometimes, you know, we, we want to avoid them going in the mud. You're Sometimes right. they just have to fall in the mud and that's right. find Why? out that they're dirty. Well, that's right. well, think about the prodigal son. He had to reach the pig pen before he was willing to realize what he had. Yeah. You know, I mean, that's scripture. Yeah. Hang on, not the dry. Hang on, not the dry. He's got hoses. He's off the Okay, so getting back to the text now. Back you think you have control of this class? You're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> What's that? Nothing. <laughs> Lord, that was Pat Costanis. <laughs> he knows. Oh, I'm sure he does. He's heard it before. <laughs> That's okay. My shoulders are broad like the rest of me. Okay, good, good, good. Okay, so I'm going to read um, my footnote of 314. Um, it says this. Paul believes it is very possible that some will ignore his warning and continue in their idle way. So he instructs the community as a whole to take note of such people and have nothing to do with them. The purpose of the disassociation is that the stubbornly insubordinate brothers will be ashamed, repent, and be restored ashamed, repent, and be restored to the community. Church discipline must always aim at renewing the fellowship, restoring the brother or sister, helping the brother or sister to get back on track with the Word of God. Dan says that it shames them, and hopefully it'll be motivation for them. It shames them, hopefully it'll be motivation. Yeah. Exactly. That's exactly right. Okay, we got eight minutes, and we only have two questions, so we're doing pretty good so far. So what is the difference between the enemy? How do you treat an enemy and an idol? That's the question we're on. We didn't... Yeah, between an idol and an what enemy, doing? what's the difference? Yeah, I think that's what's the difference now. between How an enemy? Because you're supposed to love your enemies. That's right. We're supposed to love our enemies. So what's the difference here? So, again, <laughs> church discipline 
There are some churches that have exercised church discipline historically, and all you got to do is open up church history or ask Pastor Jensen or Pastor Sandy or Pastor Joe. There's plenty of churches that have done church discipline, and they've done it poorly. They've done it incorrectly. And they have made more pain and more problem than they solve. And the reason is because um, they, they were more into the correcting and they didn't take the time and put the effort into the restoration yeah. part and the goal of church discipline is never to get rid of someone the goal of church discipline is to bring them back and bring them back in the faith according to the word of god isn't that what you believe yes yeah. okay but it's not always possible to bring them back and that is true. Now tell me why that's true. You're absolutely right. I think it has to do with the person's personality. Yes. That they don't really uh, think they did anything wrong. That, you know, even though you're showing them, and I hate to use the word wrong, right? But, you know. How about you're doing something that violates the word of God? Okay, you, yeah. You, that, that's that's, that's, that's a, what you mean, you right? Know, okay. You violate the word of God, but if you tell them that they violate the word of God. They don't see it that way. They That's see right. it. They see it that they're above the word of God. And what I did is, they try to circumnavigate or you know circumvent and find another way around it. That I really didn't do anything wrong. And I don't want to cite examples, but I know examples of even pastors who have been brought under discipline and and refused to accept their responsibility. Mm -hmm. We're beginning Revelation next week, and when we get into Revelation 2 and 3, you're going to hear me quote a verse that's used seven times in two chapters, and it's a verse that answers exactly what you're talking about, and that verse says, he that has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Yeah. Pat is right, because not everybody... You use the word personality. I'm putting it this way. Not everybody is teachable. Not yeah. everybody is willing to learn. Yeah. Not everybody will sit down to reason from the word of God. Not everybody will consider that they might be right or wrong. Yeah. That they might be wrong. As a matter of fact, I've had some people tell me, you know what? I'm not always right. But I've never been wrong. <laughs> That's a person. I see. I see finger pointing in here. That's that's a person that does not have ears to hear what the Spirit says to the churches. If you're not willing to sit down and listen to God and listen to the Holy Spirit and listen to the Word of God, then you are not teachable, and you are outside of of it and. And that is um, spiritual stubbornness. It, it, it's a lot of different things. And people that don't know how to apologize, people who don't know how to say I was wrong, are people usually are in denial. And they're in denial that we still sin as believers. You know, I'm a saved sinner, mm -hmm. but I'm still a sinner. I, and there I, are people who don't believe that. There are people who believe that once you're saved, there's no more sin in your life. They believe in what's called the eradication of the sin nature. That is, once we trust Christ, we are good to go. We're ready for heaven. Not so. Oh, Not yeah. so. We, we knew of a woman who had an affair. <clears throat> and she said, well, God is all-knowing. So he knew I was going to have that affair, and he left it happen. So it's not my fault. Yeah, and, that's, and, that's called, and that's called blame shifting. Yeah. And that's called blame shifting, and she's blaming God for her sin. Mm -hmm. We have two minutes, three minutes, and I want to finish two questions. I'm sorry, you get me started. No, you you're good. You're good. You're very good. 19. Distinguish between Christian treatment of an idol identified by Paul versus an enemy. And what did you have for that? Actually, I, I think we just, we just answered yeah. it. We More just answered yeah. that. <clears throat> Aims for restoration, whereas non Christians <laughs> aim for what? For them to salvation. come to salvation. 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 No. I yeah. couldn't hear anything like if you all spoke. One at a time now. Take turns now. There you go. Salvation. 
No, non-Christians are not aiming for salvation if no, they're against that's our us. Goal. If they're against us, remember what the question is. The Christian community aims for restoration, but the non-Christian community is aiming for what? Destruction. Your ruin. Okay? They're trying to put make you seem wrong, make you feel false. Okay? We're talking about the non-believing response to the believer. Okay? So the treatment of the idler <laughs> versus an enemy. An enemy wants your ruin. He doesn't want to help you. Right, right. He doesn't want to encourage you. Right, right. He wants you to feel like garbage. He wants you to feel like trash. He wants you to have low self-esteem. He want to ad admonish him as a brother, not as an enemy. That's exactly right. Did you hear that? Table on the left. Say that again, dear, will you? Well, it says... He, um, 15, yet count him not as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. So I guess if you're talking, you know, to them, don't Perfect. say you're wrong and that's it. <laughs> you know what I mean? And okay, you're one, more, <laughs> one more question. Question 20. How does Paul close his letter? Okay, and that's in the very end here. And this is important. Paul says, <clears throat> verse 17, I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. This is a sign of genuineness in every letter of mine. It is the way I write, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. What is Paul talking about with this sign of genuineness and letter of mine? This is the way I write. What's he talking about? His heart. I'm sorry? His heart. His heart. Okay. Actually, this question is, 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 is a really about the procedure of letter writing, okay? If you were going to write a letter, you would probably do it on your laptop, your computer, your tablet, or maybe you would write it on paper. Well, Paul didn't have any of that, and that's not the way they did things in the first century. But Paul's talking about his practice, something he does. Write this I, Paul, write this greeting, that is, goodbye, you know, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ with you, he writes that with his own hand. This is the sign of genuineness in every letter of mine. It is the way of right. So what is Paul's practice? And just so you know, what I'm going to tell you was a common practice in first century Palestine, and not only the Jews but the Greeks uh, did it too, and it was a way of writing. And what is that? By writing by a secretary. Many of Paul's letters he did not write with his own hand. Oh. And what he did is he wrote the last part of it, and he's saying in this section, write, I, Paul, write this greeting, this closing, with my own hand. This is the sign of genuineness. In every letter of mine, it is the way I write. So he dictated to a scribe, usually a personal um, um, trusted colleague to actually pen the words and then he would write the bottom part and sign it. This was a common practice in first century Palestine. Now I have one illustration and it's a little bit funny um, and I don't mean to make a joke but you can laugh about this joke, about this illustration. You probably think that that is, um, that is odd, right? I mean who does that today, right? Well, some of you that watch TV and some of you that watch political uh, advertisements have seen something exactly like what Paul did, is doing here, a political advertisement. Wow. How many of you can tell me what I it endorse is? this yeah. message? Exactly. Have the you, have, yeah. you have this political right, advertisement, yeah. and then they'll say, my name is John Smith, and I endorse this message. Yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah. And that's what Paul was doing here. Here's the letter, and Paul's saying, this is my letter, and I'm writing this, the greeting in my own hand at the very end. And so that, that's excellent. I didn't think anybody would get it that quick. Well, you hear enough of it. You would have asked us any other year, right? <laughs> and if you follow Facebook... Huh? And if you follow Facebook, you may have seen some other advertisements and how they um, do all kind of joking things with that. 
Okay, it is eight o'clock. That clock hey, is fast. Well, just, hey, just real quick. Fifth, what is the answer for 15? We read, read this whole long thing for 15, but never heard a simple answer for 15. It says, how does a Christian... Huh? Which no. one's 15? Number 15, you mean. Because, yeah, the fifth, yeah, question 15, because write? I didn't see anything about mention about the second coming in verse 11. Oh, so, wow. Well, it's talking about all. It's talking about the whole book, and the answer uh, to fifteen okay, was we'll in that on. footnote that I read from my study Bible. When the footnote said, "Some people believe that there is a connection oh, right. between the idlers and the coming of the Lord," which is what in other words, they're not about. They're not doing much, just sitting waiting, <laughs> more or less. Yeah. And, and and then Keith, stay with me. The footnote said, some people, there were two views, some people think that there's a connection between the idlers waiting and the coming of the Lord. And you got to remember, First and Second Thessalonians was one book initially. It wasn't two. So you think of it as a second book, but it really wasn't initially. In the original Greek, it's all one. Okay? So, and then he said the second verse is that they were just lazy Christians is what the footnote said, that we're just loitering and, and idling and, and, and just being, you know, um, irresponsible um, and taking advantage of the benevolence of, of people who are working. So, you know, it's kind of like, you know, Pastor Joe, you need to work overtime because my kid needs new shoes. So you need to work more so I can get a pair of shoes for my kid. That's communism. That's yeah, coming. That's <laughs> oh. So that was the attitude. <laughs> so that was the attitude. The attitude of um, I'm going to do nothing and just take all I can get. So there either was a connection, and I think it was, or there wasn't, and they were just loiterers, busybodies, and uh, lazy Christians. So you have your choice there. Does that answer your question, Keith? Yes. All right. Anything else, anyone, before we close? Any questions online? Well, thank you very much. I appreciate all of you here tonight. Oh, and next week, we are in Revelation 1, and I'm going to take the entire hour to talk about 1-1. One, one. That is chapter 1 and verse 1. There's a whole oh, good, lot. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> You'll get that verse down. I have written uh, eight pages of handouts. I have pictures that I have in plastic cases I'm bringing in of pictures of the island of Potmos that I shot while I was in Greece. So the pictures will be here and the handouts, and we'll have a great time in the Lord. Keith, I wonder if you'd close us in a word. Sure. Prayer. Heavenly Father, we just uh, thank you for this time together in your house. We do uh, dive into the Second Thessalonians, Second Thessalonians, learn more about exactly what Paul was uh, trying to tell the people there uh, about being idlers and uh, just being busybodies, and uh, that we need to dig into the Word and uh, to put you first in our lives and, and to love one another and, and uh, to share the gospel with others. Lord, we just. Uh, Ask your blessing as we head home. We ask for safe travels and uh, bring us back here safe on Sunday. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. Thank you.